Anti-blackness in this country is pervasive. It's like oxygen, it's in the air. You don't even notice it, but we're all breathing it. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I examine police brutality, how the 1960s helped define what's happening today, and why the death of a black man in Minneapolis has sparked a global movement for racial justice. To help me is a woman who says Western media would have covered America's unrest very differently if it were happening somewhere else. Karen Atia is global opinions columnist at the Washington Post. Who will watch The Watchers? That was Roman poet Juvenal. Even in antiquity, abuse of power was a concern. And so when an elite military unit known as the Praetorian Guard began policing Rome, operating like warriors instead of citizens, tensions flared. In times of war, law falls silent. That was Cicero, whose love of the Republic and disdain for militarism influenced America's founders. For John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, Caesar and his proclivity for armed force at home was not a good model for the new world. America wanted to be a genuine republic, yes, for mostly white male landowners at the time, but devoid of militarism and demagogy. It didn't quite work out that way. And 1967 was a turning point. Newark, New Jersey. A black cab driver named John Smith is beaten by white officers. Word of the incident spreads, riots erupt, and the National Guard is called in. And for the next five days, clashes ensue. A year later, President Lyndon Johnson passes the Safe Streets Act, which enables police to procure military equipment to handle future riots. At the same time, the political language in the United States is changing, and war is now a buzzword. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. The war on terror would be a lengthy war, a different kind of war, fought on many fronts in many places. Drugs, poverty, and terrorism were no longer social problems. They were instead enemies on a battlefield, and they demanded a warrior's mindset. Meanwhile, police Humvees and armored personnel carriers started to appear on America's streets. A Clinton-era Pentagon program transferred 4.3 billion of surplus military equipment to local law enforcement between 1997 and 2014. And U.S. Special Forces began training SWAT teams, leaving their mark on police culture and its appetite for heavy weaponry. We, we've got to keep our community safe, our protesters safe, but we also have to keep our officers safe. And it's a very difficult proposition at times. A more militarized police affects everyone, but minorities are the hardest hit, with, according to one study, no detectable public safety benefit. And for every 10% increase in the number of African Americans living in an area, SWAT team deployments also increased by 10%. If all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Police brutality goes up, riots ensue, and the cycle repeats. But what if there was a better way? I began with Cicero. There may be a cue from his hometown. Though modern day Rome is hardly a model of public policy, its violent crime rate remains far below the US national average. And part of the reason for that may have been a shift among Italian cops focusing on something called community policing. The idea was to exchange ideas and collaborate with civilians to make their communities safer. Sure, it's been tried in the United States, but it doesn't quite work wearing full battle gear. Karen Atiyah, uh, Global Opinions Editor for The Washington Post. Wonderful to have you here on GZR World. Thanks, Ian, for having me. So much to get into. Uh, I guess, uh, let me start with something you wrote recently, uh, saying that in two months, many corners of the world have gone from fighting over toilet paper to fighting against racism and white supremacy. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, and, and first of all, I mean, it, it just has felt like such a time warp from the concerns that we had just three or four months ago around the world. I mean, coronavirus was a global phenomenon to now this global phenomenon of 
really uh, challenging um, the narratives around around power, around race, around privilege, around violence and, and brutality. But if you look at protests in the UK, in uh, in Germany, in uh, Belgium, and you're seeing that you know. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if we look at the trajectory and the history of these issues in the United States, I mean, it was Europe that started the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, America is the country that had slavery and the brutality on its shores, but really it was it was an export. Slavery was an export from Britain. I think very often, you know, Americans, we, we tend to think, you know, just very locally, very uh, uh, sometimes insularly, but again, I mean, this is not only reckoning with this history, but I think a lot of other countries are looking to the U.S. for inspiration um, to rise up against the issues in their own countries. So, really, this is this is a fundamental shaking of a world order. I would say a, a racial world order. You know, as as somebody who grew up in the States, but has reported from abroad, has family in Africa, I really hope that we can really see the global kind of implications and underpinnings of what we're fighting against. Now, I want to ask you a tough question because, you know, this is obviously an enormously important issue. It has deep and structural roots and what's happening right now in the U.S. and around the world it has truly historic scale. It's also happening during a pandemic. How, given how important this issue is and given how dangerous this pandemic is, how do you begin to approach the fact that, how do you communicate that? How do you deal with that? How do you relate with that? Or, or is your position just, this is too important, pandemic can deal, is gonna have to just wait? The fact that people are out there willing to risk their lives um, in terms of the pandemic, in ter- a, a, a pandemic that, kills because you're in contact with people, that connection, closeness is dangerous. And yet it's that connection and it's that closeness and it's that solidarity that is driving this conversation, is driving change and is driving reform. So uh, to your question, I think it means that people feel it is that important that they really are, especially in the the US, I believe, you know, we're we're inching at the 115,000 uh, have died, Mark, and people are still taking to the streets. And the coronavirus itself, it's like this, this parallel virus that we're dealing with um, at the same time. And it's just a reminder of the inequalities that I think everybody collectively is tired of. So, you know, it's scary. I mean, to a certain extent, it, it speaks to the righteousness, I would believe, of, of the cause that people are willing to you know, march for, march in honor of a man or justice for a man who couldn't breathe in an environment where we have a virus that will rob you of your breath. So do you feel, do you feel now with what's happening in the country and around the world right now that priorities are actually changing and changing in a way that you would consider to be appropriate? Yeah. I mean, you know, as we speak today, um, we're all reeling from the the news of uh, Rashard Brooks, the murder in, in Atlanta. And I think that just renewed the frustration, renewed the anger. But you know what, you know, Ian, you asked me how I feel. I'm angry, you know, like, I think, I think, I wish it didn't have to be that a man, I would say, gets tortured to death for eight minutes on film for us to believe that this is a problem and that anti-blackness in this country is pervasive. Um, and it's like oxygen, you don't, you, you, it's in the air, you don't even notice it, but we're all breathing it, right? And so I, I feel, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that the burden is shared in terms of those conversations and in terms of, you know, white people, non-black people talking to other white people and non-black people about the, about race, about racism. Do you think, I mean, as we look at this also incredibly politicized environment, incredibly divided environment, do you see this as an issue that is becoming significant in the election itself? How do you react to what we're looking at in November? You know, 
people made the argument that Trump's election, at least in part, was in backlash to Obama and to the very visible progress of of an African-American rising to the top levels of of society. Um, And we had this illusion that electing Obama meant we were, you know, quote, in a post-racial society. And then here comes Trump um, basically uh, flying in on the wings of uh, racism and xenophobia. And we saw how far he got with many of those policies that were just outright promoting, you know, making America great again uh, by making America very white again through policy. So I think in a lot of ways, like um, this, Trump has not been able to really influence this cultural conversation right now. This is an instance where the people's movements on the ground are leading. Right now, it's almost as if we're looking to see where those conversations go, where the wind is blowing. Um, The idea that defunding the police is becoming this national conversation when a couple of years ago, that would have been completely radical. But as far as the election goes, I mean, it's forced the conversation in a very, 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 very big way. And so I, I, I think the conversations around policing um, are being held by the people. You wrote pretty movingly about when your father recounted the moment he learned of Emmett Till's death when he was a teenager in Ghana. I'm wondering how he, how they, your parents, relate to what's going on now differently than you do. I think like so many immigrant families from the Caribbean to, to Africa, we are, we are just taught that, you know, well, just work hard culturally. We just, we have differences. And of course, you know, I, I grew up in the South part of Dallas, which is heavily, heavily black and, and but like middle, cl- middle class or so. Um, we just didn't really talk much about these things uh, on the occasion if, you know, maybe I think I remember once hearing about my brother being called the N-word at soccer practice. My mom just said, oh, I just, I took care of it. And like, that was it. We never really had longer uh, discussions. But I think now I'm realizing that there was probably a lot that they were holding inside about their experiences of being black here. My mom was telling me, she'd never told me about this before, but like that my dad, uh, my dad was a a doctor, he's retired now. He would, um, if he was coming to him from the hospital and going fast, he'd make sure to have his lab coat nearby, his white coat or his stethoscope nearby, just in case he gets pulled over, just in case he can tell them, approve to them, hey, I'm a doctor, like my life (laughs) is valuable. And it's that that they never have spoken to me about that before. You did say, and it was a hopeful thing, um, that you, that that many outside the United States are not just looking at the U.S. and saying I hate everything about that system, but also seeing the grassroots movement and being inspired by it, and a grassroots movement that is by no means only the Black American community participating in it. You know what I. I've always liked to say is that uh, America is a developing country, right? To move from a slaveholding economy to a democracy, a multi-ethnic democracy, um, is is a unique experience that, that that the entire world has been looking to for such a long time. As much as it is a bit of a perilous time, in the sense of there are people dying from the coronavirus. Um, perilous in terms of even the protesters who have been met by force, um, people who are risking their jobs to speak out even about racism. Um, I think this is a, this is a, a struggle that needs to be had, and a necessary struggle for for our growth. I feel like this moment is like very pregnant with promise for like just imagining differently, and it might not get all the way to the level of. I mean, whatever sort of will happen. But I think, you know, we are reimagining our, what community means, um, 
who who what it means to to lead uh, and i think it, to a certain extent i don't feel like we're looking to our politicians right now to to lead they're reacting to what the conversation is being pushed toward literally like people are pushing over statues of supremacist white supremacists and enslavers in the confederacy now we've seen people are willing to be in the streets in the middle of a pandemic facing tear gas and bullets and curfews in order to push for a different America. And that should be hard to ignore, it should be. So uh, Karen, you brought Jamal Khashoggi, the, uh, the Saudi um, columnist who was killed, um, executed uh, in the Saudi consulate in Turkey um, to the Washington Post. Um, you know, also question of just basic human justice and dignity. How, how do you think about that? background for you personally, given what's happening right now? I remember um, when it came out that Jamal's last words um, before he was uh, strangled to death was, I can't breathe. Uh, I couldn't help but make that connection to, at the time, Eric Garner, um, the black man in New, in New York who was killed um, by a police officer who was also um, choked out. And he also said, I can't breathe. And here we are uh, now in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, um, who's, he was killed by a, a knee on his neck, also saying, I can't breathe. And we saw yeah, that yeah, in the yeah. case of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And we're still trying to push for you know, any sort of accountability uh, you know, in the in the case of Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince who uh, the CIA determined was responsible for Jamal's ki killing. And then here we have a system in the United States where um, getting a con an arrest, much less a conviction for a police officer who murders and ki or kills a person in the United States is extremely difficult. Um, and just speaks to these questions of impunity and these questions of of cruelty, really. And so, to me, um, I I link the two because, again, they're fundamentally about human dignity and the fact that people who live in oppressive societies they often talk about it. They feel like they can't breathe, they can't speak, they can't be, they can't, in Jamal's case, he couldn't write. He felt like he was suffocating in Saudi Arabia, which is why he came to the United States only to find out he still wasn't safe. And so similar to, as I said earlier, about being black and, and you think that if you're respectable, if you have the right accoutrements, the right degrees, if you, if you talk to the officer nicely and try to de-escalate, you think that that will protect you. And it's not the case if you're going up against a force that does not value your life as a human being. Karen Atia, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That's our show this week. Come back next week, and if you like what you see, take a minute to sign up for G-Zero's excellent morning newsletter, Signal.